After a grueling week at the office, I longed for an escape, a way to forget the monotony of my miserable job. Just like others sought solace in various ways, I would head to my sawmill. This place, a rustic haven nestled in a clearing amidst thick woods, held a special place in my heart. It had been passed down through generations, starting with my grandfather, who had left it to my dad. My father had tried to turn it into a business, but eventually gave it to me when it didn't pan out. It may not have been a fancy operation, lacking the big sophisticated machines, but it carried the legacy of my family, and I cherished it. The journey to the sawmill was always an adventure in itself. A winding dirt road, deep into the woods, took me there in about 15 to 20 minutes, depending on my driving speed. When I arrived, the distinct aroma of sawdust greeted me, intertwined with the earthy scent of the surrounding forest. My boots crunched against the gravel driveway as I stepped out of my car, and a smile crept across my face as I anticipated the weekend ahead. The old wooden building, weathered by time, had a rustic beauty of its own, painted in a faded red with peeling paint. My trusty pickup truck, which I used to transport logs, was parked in front. The golden light streaming through dusty windows bathed the interior in a warm glow. Tools hung neatly on the walls, and workbenches still bore the remnants of wood chips from my last project. At the heart of the room stood the imposing saw, capable of slicing through even the thickest logs. As I thought about the table I was about to craft for my friend Matt's front porch, the forest that surrounded the sawmill beckoned as a source of inspiration. Venturing deeper than ever before, I sought out smaller trees and branches, with an idea to repurpose them into something special for Matt. The woods seemed to stretch infinitely, the scent of pine heavy in the air, and the ground carpeted with fallen leaves. It was serene, but faintly eerie, making my senses tingle with anticipation. After some time, I found what I needed. Small pine trees that had fallen naturally, creating an opportunity for repurposing. I carefully cut them into manageable pieces, knowing I'd have to make several trips to transport them to my pickup, which couldn't navigate the deeper woods. With each step, my unease grew, a sense of foreboding I couldn't shake, but I shrugged it off as paranoia, convinced I was merely lost in the unfamiliar part of the woods. However, that unease escalated into full-blown fear when I glimpsed a figure behind me, a man standing near a tree. My heart raced as I quickened my pace, my mind racing with thoughts of why someone would be here in the woods. I dropped my cargo, running as fast as I could back to the sawmill. Panic set in as I considered my options. Should I get into my truck, or would he catch up before I could escape? Instead, I opted to reach the sawmill first. I burst through the door, locking it and shutting the blinds. My heart pounded as I clutched a piece of wood, my only means of defense. The man outside remained motionless, casting a sinister shadow under the door. Time seemed to stretch indefinitely, my mind racing for answers. Who was he? Why was he chasing me through the woods? The fear that gripped me intensified with each passing second. What do you want? I shouted, my voice trembling. This is private property. Leave or you'll be shot. My threat hung in the air, though it was an empty one. But the man remained outside, reciting incomprehensible words in a strange, rhythmic cadence. It was like a chant, unsettling and eerie. My memory becomes hazy after that. It's as if a fog blankets the events, obscuring my recollection. One moment, I held a piece of wood, and the next, I found myself on the floor, my head throbbing with pain. I surveyed my surroundings, and to my relief, the door remained locked, the windows intact. As I regained my senses, I became aware of something outside, a creature running around the sawmill, growling and hissing. It wasn't the man who had pursued me earlier. Through the shuttered windows, I glimpsed fur and four legs. The creature's presence sent chills down my spine. After a few more laps, it abruptly darted away into the darkness. I sat on the floor trembling, unable to comprehend the bizarre turn of events. The place that had offered me comfort had turned into a nightmarish ordeal. I could feel my heart racing, my mind spinning. 
I clung to the stick in my hand, ready to defend myself against whatever came next. Hours seemed to pass, or maybe it was only minutes. The man remained outside, motionless, while I struggled to make sense of the situation. Who were these people, and what did they want? Eventually, the eerie silence was broken, but not by the man. Instead, something else, something with four legs and fur, circled the sawmill. It growled and hissed, its presence a haunting enigma. When it finally retreated into the woods, I couldn't stay inside any longer. With trembling hands, I unlocked the door, cautiously opening it. The night was pitch black, and the moon cast eerie shadows in every direction. I stepped outside, clutching the piece of wood tightly. The stillness was oppressive, devoid of the usual forest sounds. No crickets, no owls, just an eerie void of silence. I made my way to my car, parked by the road, but before I could drive away, I heard something, an unfamiliar, unsettling noise emanating from the woods. Slowly, I turned my head toward the source and locked eyes with two large, glowing orbs. My stomach churned as I realized they belonged to the creature that had been circling the sawmill. In that moment it produced a sound so spine-chilling and malevolent that it would haunt my nightmares forever. I slammed my foot on the gas pedal and sped away, dust and smoke billowing behind me. I glanced in the rearview mirror and saw the creature trailing me, but I was driving too fast for it to catch up. Finally, I reached the main road, and with a sigh of relief, I knew I was close to safety. The creature ceased its pursuit, and I sped away, my heart still pounding with fear. When I arrived home, I was overwhelmed by exhaustion and stress, and I collapsed into a deep sleep. Three years have passed since that horrifying encounter, and I still have no answers. I've never returned to the sawmill, not after that nightmarish ordeal. The memory of the strange man's chanting and the haunting presence in the woods is etched into my mind forever, a chilling reminder of the unknown horrors that exist in the world. In 1984, I found myself entangled in a horrifying tale of darkness and despair, one that would forever haunt the remote wilderness of Manly Springs, Alaska. This sinister narrative revolved around the enigmatic figure of Michael Silka, whose actions would cast an indelible shadow over the communities he touched. The mystery shrouding his motivations and the fate of some of his victims only added to the tragedy that unfolded before us. As I delved deeper into the eerie depths of this story, it became apparent that Michael Silka was not an ordinary man. His life was punctuated by a chilling fascination with firearms and the untamed wilderness, a combination that often led individuals down treacherous paths. Silka's criminal history was a harrowing testament to his sinister inclinations, featuring arrests for robbery and weapons possession. It painted a portrait of a deeply troubled individual, whose attraction to firearms and outdoor living bordered on obsession. The events that transpired in Manly Springs, Alaska in 1984 were particularly terrifying. Silka's involvement in the disappearance of several innocent souls, followed by a harrowing shootout with law enforcement that claimed the life of Trooper Troy Duncan, sent shockwaves through the community. The fact that some of the victims' bodies were never recovered added an extra layer of sorrow and despair to this grim tale. Silka's motivations for his heinous actions remained a perplexing enigma. It was a baffling conundrum to comprehend what drove a person to commit such unspeakable acts, especially when they chose to take their own life in the process, as Silka did during the fateful confrontation with the law. Without a deeper understanding of his mental state and the circumstances that surrounded his crimes, it felt nearly impossible to fathom why he embarked on this dark journey. The case of Michael Silka served as a stark reminder of the intricacies of human behavior and the daunting challenges that law enforcement faces when dealing with heavily armed individuals teetering on the brink of violence. It underscored the importance of community support in the tireless efforts made by authorities and the grieving families of the victims to seek justice and find closure in the face of such unspeakable tragedy. 
The story of 1984 unfurled like a chilling nightmare in the remote wilderness of Manly Springs, Alaska, as Michael Silka, an Illinois native, embarked on a macabre killing spree. Silka's lifelong fascination with the wilderness and firearms had marked his teenage years with troubling encounters with the law. His obsession with the great outdoors and firearms drove him to commit multiple robberies of sporting goods stores, seeking camping equipment and guns. At one point, he even ran away to the Canadian wilderness with his brother, returning only when their supplies dwindled. However, Silka's legal troubles persisted as he frequently found himself detained and fined for openly carrying a 19th century muzzle loader in 1978. In a desperate bid for structure, Silka enlisted in the United States Army in 1978. Despite his exceptional skills with weapons during basic training, his unruly behavior, including discharging his gun in the barracks and assaulting a military police officer, led to his discharge in 1981. Back in civilian life, Silka's penchant for trouble continued. In 1982, he was pulled over by a traffic patrolman, who discovered a collection of firearms and knives in his car, resulting in a brief jail sentence. A similar incident occurred in 1983, prompting Silka to flee to the remote Alaskan village of Chena Ridge. However, trouble seemed to follow him even to the wilderness. His neighbor, Roger Culp, mysteriously went missing, and while Culp's body was never found, traces of blood near his home implicated Silka as a prime suspect. Before law enforcement could question him further, Silka vanished, only to reappear in Manly Springs about a month later. Silka, seemingly a survivalist in his element, impressed the locals with his outdoor skills. However, tragedy struck when six locals, including a pregnant woman and a young child, disappeared near the boat landing. Authorities discovered blood and shell casings at the scene, once again casting suspicion on Silka. This time, Silka fled with a stolen boat, setting off a dramatic manhunt. A day later, authorities located him 25 miles away from Manly Springs. In a tense and fatal confrontation, Silka opened fire on law enforcement, fatally shooting Trooper Troy Duncan and injuring Captain Donald Lawrence. In response, officers returned fire ultimately killing Silka. After Silka's death, the search for the missing victims intensified, with four bodies eventually being recovered months later. However, the remains of the other four victims, including Roger Culp, remained undiscovered. The motivations behind Silka's violent actions died with him, leaving a haunting mystery lurking in the Alaskan wilderness. The tragic case of Michael Silka served as a grim reminder of the intricate and often bewildering nature of human behavior. It highlighted the daunting challenges faced by law enforcement when confronting heavily armed individuals on the brink of violence. It also emphasized the crucial role of community support in the tireless efforts of authorities and the grief-stricken families of the victims who relentlessly sought justice and closure in the wake of such a nightmarish ordeal. The holiday season was always the busiest time of year for us postal workers, with people shifting gifts and cards going out. Our workload doubled in December, at the very least. But after the bizarre incident I had delivering packages a few days before Christmas several years back, I started to dread those festive months. Even now, I get anxious doing my route when the holidays roll around. I'd worked for the post office in my hometown for over a decade when this went down, I really enjoyed it for the most part. Sure, the job could be stressful, especially during the holiday crunch, but I liked the feeling of providing an important service, being out and about delivering letters and parcels. It suited my tendencies as a creature of habit. I even had my route down to a science, knowing exactly how long each block would take. In 2015, the week before Christmas was an absolute madhouse as usual. Every day my truck was packed floor to ceiling with boxes and overflowing bags of mail. The packages were especially out of control. It seemed like every individual in town was getting online gifts shipped from retailers. By December 23rd I was exhausted from the non-stop influx. My route that day was crammed with over 300 packages for delivery, all locked and loaded in the back of my truck. As I set out, light snow started to fall, adding an extra challenge. 
I knew this was going to be a long slog, but despite being worn out, I methodically worked my way down each street, dropping off boxes and envelopes at every address. The neighborhood I was in had a lot of cute older homes decked out for the holidays with lights and inflatables, which helped to brighten the dreary weather. About two hours in, I pulled up to a yellow two-story house on Walnut Street that had an unusually large pile of boxes waiting on the porch. I parked and gathered the things I would be delivering. As I arranged them on the welcome mat, I noticed the door was cracked about an inch. Through the gap, there was only darkness inside. Feeling uneasy, I rang the bell and knocked, calling out a greeting. No response, no movement from within. I checked the shipping labels, verifying that this was indeed the correct address they were delivered to. Glancing around behind me, the whole block seemed oddly still and quiet. When I peered back through the door crack, it was pitch dark, not a single light on in there. A prickle of dread crept up my spine. I knew something wasn't right here. My instinct was to call the police, but without enough evidence of anything actually wrong happening besides a dark house and an open door with piled packages, I didn't know if they would even respond. I went back to my truck and deliberated on what to do. Starting to drive away didn't sit right with me. What if someone inside was hurt? I decided I had to check to be sure. Taking a deep breath, I slowly pushed the front door all the way open and looked around. I called out who I was and that I was there to deliver packages from the USPS. No reply came back. Turning on my flashlight, I waved the beam around over everything. The front rooms were orderly if sparsely furnished, and a fine layer of dust-coated surfaces, hinting that no one had been there in a while. I took tentative steps down the hallway, checking each room as I went. Bedrooms and the kitchen were just as neatly abandoned, but there was no sign of who belonged there or where they'd gone. It was like the occupants had simply vanished without taking anything. The further I explored each empty room, the more ominous the atmosphere felt. Disturbingly, there was also no holiday decor or anything to suggest that the people who lived here had been planning to celebrate, which might have been the case considering all the packages they'd had delivered. Just an empty shell of a suburban home, as I approached the closed door at the end of the hall, my dread peaked. I knew that if there was any evidence of what happened to the occupants, it would be behind that final barrier. Every instinct I had told me to turn back, but I'd come this far, and I had to know. With a deep breath I turned the knob and pushed it open. The stench hit me first, decay and bodily waste. Resisting nausea, I shone my light into what looked like a child's room. It was empty except for a small shape curled up in the corner. My heart dropped when the beam illuminated a young girl, motionless and facing the wall. I took a step closer, dreading but expecting the worst. That's when her head turned sharply towards me, her eyes wild, clouded white, blood around cracked lips. My light reflected off something clutched in her hand, torn flesh hanging from exposed bone. I recoiled in horror as a strangled, inhuman growl erupted from the girl. Every cell in my body screamed to run. I backpedaled just as she lunged, narrowly missing my wrist. As I crashed through the doorway, the sound that came from her was part shriek, part gurgling snarl, assaulting my ears as I fled down the hall. Bursting outside, I slammed the front door behind me. Through it came anguished cries as I half tumbled into my truck and sped off down the street. My mind was in shambles, trying to process what I'd witnessed in that innocuous suburban home. I drove straight to the police station, in shock. My report brought a swarm of vehicles out to Walnut Street, along with an ambulance. But when they entered the home, there was no sign of the girl having been there, just an abandoned home with doors now locked and no clues left behind. With no proof besides my word, the cops wrote it off as holiday stress or perhaps an encounter with a home intruder during a delivery. But I knew what I saw, and those soulless eyes staring back still haunt me to this day. I put in for a new route the next week, wanting no part of that neighborhood again. For a couple of years afterwards, around Christmas, families on Walnut Street reported sounds of anguished cries coming from inside the walls of the empty house each night. But by morning, silence returned. Eventually the home would be demolished. 
an evil that leaves wounds beyond the physical. I still don't know what happened there, but some nights when I close my eyes, I feel like I can see that little girl's twisted face leering back from the darkness. Just remembering what was in that house is enough to make my blood run cold. The story I'm about to share is a chilling tale that unfolds in the heart of rural southern Ohio, near the edge of the sprawling Appalachian Trail. It's a place where, as you grow up, you always hear unsettling ghost stories about what happens when the sun dips below the horizon. To truly understand this story, it's essential to describe the layout of my grandparents' property. My grandparents' house is nestled on a vast expanse of five acres, encircled by dense, imposing woodlands. On their property, there are seven different trails that wind their way around, primarily used for hunting. On this particular day, my brother and I decided to embark on a journey along these trails, much like we usually did, enjoying the thrill of riding four-wheelers and savoring the serene beauty of my grandparents' secluded property. The trail we chose led us through the woods, and it eventually forked into two distinct paths. To the left, the trail looped back toward the house, while the other route led to a creek where we could sit and observe the abundant wildlife. Intrigued by the prospect of caring for animals and searching for intriguing rocks, a hobby of mine, we opted to head down to the creek. The dense underbrush and trees on this particular trail made it impossible for the four-wheeler to proceed, so we left it behind and ventured forth on foot. The path to the creek stretched for about a mile, and as we walked, the late afternoon sun filtered through the trees, casting long, eerie shadows. It was a crisp fall evening, and a slight breeze rustled the leaves, creating an unsettling symphony of rustling. After a brisk walk, my brother and I eventually reached the creek. We spent about fifteen minutes strolling alongside the water, reveling in the tranquility of the secluded spot. As we continued our exploration, our footsteps led us to a discovery we had not expected, a decrepit, broken-down shed. It was a shed we had never seen before, and it piqued our curiosity. It's crucial to mention that my grandparents' property was well marked with boundary indicators. The shed we encountered was on the opposite side of the creek, and it stood as a silent enigma. My brother and I exchanged puzzled glances, but soon, my brother's attention was diverted by something else. He moved on, eager to explore further. However, I couldn't tear my eyes away from the shed. I felt drawn to it, as though some unseen force compelled me to investigate further. I called out to my brother, urging him to return. I suggested we should check out the shed in more detail, but my brother had never been a fan of anything remotely scary, and the sight of the rundown structure did not interest him. Reluctantly, we decided to return to the house, and the shed slipped from our thoughts. That night, something strange and unsettling began to happen. For some inexplicable reason, I kept waking up with feverish dreams, drenched in cold sweat. It was as if a heavy cloud of dread hung over me, and I couldn't shake the feeling of impending doom. I experienced episodes of sleep paralysis, my mind trapped in a nightmarish cycle of fear. In these terrifying visions, I found myself standing on the left side of the creek, gazing at the rundown shed. In the dream, the shed's door would creak open, releasing a dark, malevolent mist. And then, a pair of ominous, glowing eyes would materialize within the fog. It was as if I were being drawn closer, against my will, toward that dreadful shed. I would be dragged inside by some invisible force, and in my dream, I would never return. The sensation was nightmarish, and it plagued my restless slumber throughout the night. The following day, I couldn't shake off the haunting images and sensations that had besieged me. Determined to confront this unsettling place and find some semblance of closure, I decided to return to the site of the shed. However, when I arrived, it was as though the shed had vanished into thin air. I scoured the area, searching high and low, but there was no trace of it. I even asked my brother, who insisted that there had never been a shed there. The inexplicable nature of the shed's disappearance left me questioning my own sanity. Had I experienced some kind of supernatural encounter, 
or was it all a product of my overactive imagination? To this day, I remain haunted by the enigmatic shed by the creek, uncertain of what truly transpired on that eerie autumn day in rural southern Ohio. I discovered a remarkable productivity booster that has improved my mornings. As someone passionate about caffeine, I previously relied heavily on a plethora of energy drinks and coffee to power through my days. But now, I've embraced a novel addition to my daily regime that's portable and effortlessly integrates into my lifestyle. This has swiftly become my preferred choice for an instant energy lift, a part of my daily routine due to its sheer convenience. To my delight, it not only tastes great, but has also significantly diminished my craving for caffeine. Since incorporating Magic Mind into my everyday life, it has transformed into an indispensable morning ally. The key benefit for me is the enhanced mental clarity and focus it provides. There's a noticeable reduction in stress and anxiety, which helps manage my ADHD, alongside improvements in sleep quality and memory retention. Magic Mind stands out for its premium all-natural ingredients, carefully selected from the finest sources. It's a versatile choice, being sugar-free, nut-free, vegan, keto, and paleo-friendly, catering to diverse dietary needs. The highlight ingredient, organic ashwagandha, contributes to reduced stress and anxiety. This is not only because Magic Mind boosts productivity, but also due to the presence of L-theanine, which naturally lowers the body's stress response. Sharing Magic Mind with friends has been a joy, especially for those of us who are avid coffee enthusiasts. It's been instrumental in helping us reduce our coffee intake. You can now find it in all Sprouts Farmers Market stores across the country. If you have a Sprouts store nearby, get down there and grab a few bottles to try. After you're hooked, you can get a subscription with up to 50% off at www.magicmind.com forward slash just creepy with my code just creepy 20. In the summer of 2005, I was just 16 years old, working my first part-time job at the local McDonald's in suburban Oregon. It wasn't exactly the way I had envisioned spending my summer, but I knew that I needed to start saving money if I wanted to go to college. To make matters worse, I was almost always scheduled to work the closing shift. The restaurant, usually bustling with activity during the day, took on a different character at night, a quiet, eerie character. The clock on the wall seemed to crawl towards midnight as my shift manager, Sarah, and I went through the closing routine. Sarah and I actually attended the same high school, and though she was two grades above me, we had become acquainted over the course of many closing shifts together over the past month. The fryers had cooled down, the grills were scrubbed clean, and the dining area was nearly deserted, with only a few straggling customers remaining, nursing the last sips of their sodas. That's when he walked in, a tall, lanky man, probably in his late thirties, clad in a baggy stained jacket and a faded black baseball cap that shadowed his face. His eyes darted around the restaurant with unsettling intensity as he shuffled towards the counter. I realized with a chill that I had seen him earlier that night, lingering near the drink station, but I hadn't thought much of it then. Can I take your order, sir? Sarah asked with a polite smile, but I could see her unease. The man mumbled something under his breath, making it hard to catch what he wanted. She repeated her question, and he leaned in closer, his eyes fixed on Sarah's name tag. Sarah, he read aloud, a sinister smile tugging at the corners of his lips. You're a friendly one, Sarah. My heart began to race, and I busied myself with wiping down tables, keeping a close eye on the unsettling exchange. Sarah completed the order a small meal seemingly chosen at random, and handed the man his tray. He then went off to sit at a corner booth, staring towards the front counter with unblinking eyes. As the minutes ticked by and the few remaining customers finished their meals and departed, an eerie silence descended upon the restaurant. It was just me, Sarah, and the stranger in the corner. When I rejoined Sarah behind the counter, she whispered to me, I don't like this guy. He's giving me the creeps. I nodded, feeling a cold shiver run down my spine. The man never even touched his food, never took a bite. Instead, he just sat there, 
watching Sarah like a hungry predator observing his prey. Finally, Sarah suggested we wrap up our closing duties, hoping the man would get the hint and leave. We wiped down the remaining tables, locked the doors, and started turning off the lights. But when we glanced over at the corner, the man was still there. My anxiety skyrocketed as Sarah took in a breath and said in a shaking voice, Sir, I apologize, but we closed ten minutes ago. You'll need to get ready to go. The man remained still, as if he hadn't heard her. After an uncomfortably quiet moment, Sarah said to me, We need to call the cops. This is just too strange. As she moved towards the panic button under the register, the man suddenly stood up, nearly knocking the table over. Now his eyes were wide, and he began muttering something incoherent. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as he took a step towards us, his movements erratic and unpredictable. Without speaking, Sarah and I rushed to the back office. I can remember watching her fumble with her ring of manager keys to unlock it. It probably only lasted a few seconds, but it felt like it took forever for her to find the right key and jam it into the lock. Finally, we stumbled into the cramped office and locked the flimsy door behind us. I could hear the man's footsteps behind us, his deranged muttering growing louder. Sarah repeatedly pushed the panic button while dialing 911 on the office phone. Dispatch assured us that help was on the way, but I couldn't shake the feeling that this man was going to break the door down at any second. When the police finally arrived, they found the man hiding in the restroom, crouched in a stall like some sort of trapped animal. He was arrested, but I will never forget the madness in his eyes, the way he had fixated on Sarah like a predator. The investigation revealed that the man apparently had a history of disturbing behavior at other local chain restaurants, and he had been on the run from the authorities. I couldn't believe how close we had come to something unspeakable happening to us in the dimly lit back office of a McDonald's of all places. I thanked my lucky stars that Sarah and I had managed to escape safely from this midnight creeper who had terrified two teenage girls working at the local McDonald's. I had no idea what he had intended for us that night, but I hoped he got whatever help he needed. I don't quite know how to begin recounting the terrifying ordeal that unfolded just an hour ago. I'm still trembling with fear as I put these words down, but I feel compelled to share this chilling experience. My friend and I are currently home alone, and we've been in this state of solitude for a few hours now. Whenever he comes over, our usual ritual is to venture into the woods behind my house. Ordinarily, our woodland excursions are uneventful, filled with playful rock-throwing and harmless tree-breaking antics. However, tonight was different. As I mentioned, we were alone at home for quite some time, and that's when we decided to head outside to the woods. The initial part of our journey seemed like any other. The path was dimly lit by the setting sun, and our footsteps echoed through the silence. But as we ventured deeper into the woods, an eerie feeling began to creep over us. Something just felt off. The atmosphere was thick with an unsettling tension. The once familiar forest had transformed into an alien landscape. Countless trees lay toppled, as if a powerful force had rampaged through the area, leaving chaos in its wake. Despite this ominous change, we continued further into the woods, engaging in our usual mischievous activities. After a while, my friend turned to me, a hint of unease in his eyes, and suggested that we should head back. I glanced at my phone and realized we had only been in the woods for thirty minutes. Figuring we had a few hours before anyone would expect us home, I persuaded him to stay a bit longer. Little did we know, this decision would lead us into a nightmarish encounter. Our exploration took a more sinister turn as we stumbled upon peculiar remnants scattered about. An old crushed coke can, possibly from a decade or two ago, lay on the forest floor. Nearby, we discovered a toy boat that had been mercilessly ravaged by the elements, a testament to the passage of time. It was as though we had stepped into a place untouched by the modern world, where forgotten relics lingered. We decided to venture deeper into the woods than I had ever been before, which wasn't particularly challenging given my limited past explorations. As we trekked further into the wilderness, we reached a landmark that marked the farthest point I had previously ventured, 
A bridge made from a fallen log spanned a narrow river in the heart of the forest. However, this time, something was different. Sitting atop the log bridge was an object that sent shivers down our spines. It appeared to be a small, animal-like head. As we drew closer to get a better look, the realization struck us like a hammer blow. It was a deer skull. The skull was pristine, its bone bleached pearly white, and it rested on the bridge without any apparent explanation. It was an unsettling sight, leaving us wondering who had placed it there and why, and where the rest of the deer's remains might be. As we gazed at the eerie scene before us, our attention was drawn to a massive hill on the other side of the river. Perched atop the hill was a dilapidated and creepy-looking small house, its presence sending a shiver down my spine. Something about that house seemed utterly out of place in the depths of the woods. Then the atmosphere suddenly changed. A high-pitched sound, like a distant creaking, reached our ears, and it was steadily approaching. Panic set in, and without a second thought I broke into a sprint, my heart pounding in my chest. Behind me I heard my friend scream, and his footsteps echoed my own as he sprinted to catch up. We ran blindly through the darkened forest, our breaths ragged, and fear gnawing at our souls. Finally, we burst out of the woods and onto the road. Gasping for breath, I asked my friend why he had screamed, and he told me that he had heard footsteps right beside him, even as we were running. The realization that something had been lurking in the woods with us, concealed in the shadows, was almost too much to bear. We hurried back home, our hearts still racing. As we approached the house, we noticed that the garage door was ajar. We couldn't remember if we had left it open or not, but we didn't want to take any chances. We rushed inside, locking all the doors, meticulously checking every room, and setting the alarm system in a state of high alert. To this day, I can't explain what was out there in the woods with us that night. The deer skull on the bridge and the eerie house on the hill remain haunting symbols of an encounter with an inexplicable and malevolent presence. It was an experience that chilled us to the bone, and I'm left with a lingering fear of what dwells in the depths of those woods. I live on the outskirts of Buffalo, a city that never seems to sleep. Despite its bustling nature, life on the outskirts can be eerily quiet especially in the small town where I recently began working at the local library. The library is a grand old building with thousands of books, and it sees a constant stream of people coming and going throughout the day. I've been employed here for almost four months now, and during that time, I've experienced some strange and unsettling incidents that have left me questioning the reality of the world around me. One particular incident stands out in my memory. It was a typical day at the library, and I had just finished using the restroom. As I exited the stall and reached for my purse, I noticed an elderly woman standing at the sink. She appeared friendly, wearing a brown sweater and a tan skirt. I smiled at her before turning to grab my purse, but I heard no door close or footsteps indicating her departure. When I turned back around, she had vanished without a trace. Confused, I left the restroom and returned to the front desk to continue my work trying to push the strange encounter to the back of my mind. A few weeks later, I was working an overnight shift with my co-worker, Amy. It was late, and we were tasked with restocking the shelves for the next day's patrons. I was responsible for handling reference materials, which required me to go down to the lowest floor of the library. The late-night atmosphere always made me feel uneasy, and the hallways were eerily quiet. The elevator ride down was accompanied by a high-pitched electric hum that seemed to echo through the semi-dark corridors. As I stepped out of the elevator and entered a room, I was greeted by darkness. This room was always supposed to be well lit, as it housed expensive records under surveillance. I headed down the hallway to reach the light switch, my unease growing. But as I flipped the switch and turned to leave, I heard a soft sound behind me. My heart raced as I realized that my book cart had moved from where I had left it, and now sat by a chair in the middle of the room. I considered the possibility that the cart's wheels weren't locked, and the uneven floor had caused it to roll. With a handful of books, I started placing them back on the shelves along the wall. That's when I caught a glimpse of movement, 
something tan darting past the edge of a bookshelf. Fear surged through me, as I knew that only Amy and I were supposed to be in the building at this hour. Our petite statures were hardly a match for an intruder. My hand instinctively reached for my phone, with security's number on speed dial. I was about to call Harry, our night guard, when I heard another noise. Rounding the corner of a shelf with a heavy book in one hand, I continued along the shelves, pretending the book offered some form of protection. My trembling fingers dialed Harry's number, and I explained what I had seen. He immediately sounded concerned and assured me he would check the security cameras. My eyes darted around the darkened room as I waited for his response. That's when I heard it, the soft taps outside the door. It was a small study room with a glass wall, and I could see a figure crumpled underneath a low wooden table. The person was wearing tattered brown clothes, had a long, unkempt beard, and wild, manic eyes. My breath caught in my throat as I noticed something glinting in his hand. A silver and black object coated in aged brown colors. Perhaps rust. Perhaps something far more sinister. Terror coursed through me, and I couldn't stop the tears from flowing as I sat there, paralyzed by fear. I knew he couldn't get to me as long as the glass held, but the sheer panic and dread overwhelmed me. I sobbed quietly, helpless, and trapped. After what felt like an eternity, I mustered the courage to call Harry again, explaining the dire situation. He promised to call the police and check on me regularly. The police arrived about ten minutes later, but by that time, the man had become more unhinged. He repeatedly slammed the blade into the window, his lips twisted in a grotesque smile. It was as if he derived some sick pleasure from his violent actions. The officers had to wrestle with him, and one of them was cut on the arm by the blade before they managed to disarm and subdue him. I provided my statement to the police, and a few days later, I reached out to get more information about the intruder. It turned out that he had been under the influence of drugs and had been seeking shelter for the night. When he saw me, he assumed I would throw him out, leading him to stalk me with murderous intent. Following that harrowing incident, the library increased its security measures, and Amy and I made a pact to never leave each other's side during our shifts. But even with these precautions in place, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched or the fear that someone might lurk in the shadows. The trauma of that night continues to haunt me, and I know it will be a long time before I stop looking over my shoulder or jumping at every little noise in the dark. There's a certain kind of freedom you feel when you're hundreds of feet above the ground, nothing but open air and a whispering breeze your only companions. That's where I find my peace, or at least what passes for peace in my book. My name isn't important, but what I do, now that's another story. I'm the guy you see in those YouTube videos, clinging to a cell tower like a spider to its web in the heart of Appalachia. It's not just a job for me, it's the closest thing to feeling alive. I never did finish high school. The walls of a classroom felt more like a prison than anything educational, so I took to the wild, the open spaces where rules were suggestions and risks were a way of life. In these parts, jobs aren't exactly growing on trees, especially for someone with a resume as thin as mine. But cell tower technician? That fit the bill just fine. It was like the job was made for a screw-up adrenaline junkie like me. The thing about these towers, they're not just ladders to the sky. They're gateways to a thrill you can't find anywhere else. I'm talking about base jumping, the art of leaping off a fixed object with nothing but a parachute and a prayer. There's a raw purity in that moment of freefall, where the world stands still and you're suspended in time. It's the grown-up version of jumping off your roof with a bedsheet, except you're playing for keeps. The morning they sent me out to that tower, about 50 miles from the semblance of civilization, the world was draped in a fine mist, the kind that locals say is perfect for moonshining, staying indoors and getting lost in a bottle. I should have listened, should have stayed in bed, but the call of that tower, looming in the distance, was too strong to ignore. I packed my gear into the back of my beat-up jeep, the parachute neatly folded, a silent promise of the jump to come. 
There's something about preparing for a climb, a jump, that's almost ceremonial. It's a dance with danger, a flirtation with fate, and I love every second of it. The drive out to the site was a journey through a world half asleep. Mist hung low, blanketing the hollows and ridges in a ghostly shroud. Appalachia has a way of holding secrets, and in that fog, it felt like driving through a dream, the kind of dream you're not sure you want to wake up from. I reached the tower, a behemoth of steel and wires, a silent sentinel in the midst of nowhere. Graffiti covered the base, colorful scars on its gray skin, stories left by others who dared to venture this far. But today, it was just me, the tower, and a sky waiting to be conquered. Climbing that tower was like shaking hands with destiny. Each rung was a step further from the world below, a world too small, too confined. Up there, among the clouds, I was free, free from expectations, from past mistakes. Just a man, a tower, and a sky full of possibilities. I thought I knew fear, thought I had seen it all. But that day, that climb, it was about to show me that fear has many faces, and some of them are beyond anything you can imagine. The world was still draped in a half-light when I set off that morning, the kind of gray dawn that clings to the Appalachian hollows like a lingering dream. My jeep, a faithful but battered steed, seemed to grumble in protest as I coaxed it to life, its engine rumbling a rough melody that spoke of many a mile and many a story. Driving through those winding mountain roads, I couldn't help but feel a kinship with the rugged landscape around me. The mist hung heavy, a blanket that obscured the world beyond, turning familiar sights into shadows and mysteries. It was as if the mountains themselves were whispering secrets, tales of old miners and forgotten trails, of lives lived hard and lost young. I've always found a certain solace in solitude, a comfort in the isolation that these remote places offer. Out here, a man could be his true self, unshackled from the expectations and norms of society. In the quiet of these mountains, with only the sound of my jeep's tires on the gravel road for company, I felt that old, familiar sense of freedom stirring within me. As I neared the tower, the reality of the task at hand began to set in. This wasn't just another climb. It was an opportunity to push the boundaries, to test myself against the elements and the heights. The thought brought a grin to my face, a rush of adrenaline that made my heart beat faster. Base jumping was more than a hobby for me. It was a challenge, a way to prove to myself that I was more than just another dropout, more than just another face in the crowd. The tower itself stood like a sentinel, a monolith of steel and cables that reached defiantly into the sky. It was a testament to human ingenuity and audacity, a structure that defied nature even as it became a part of the landscape. As I parked my jeep and gathered my gear, I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe. Here was a creation that stood tall and unyielding, a challenge to the heavens themselves. But as I approached, something felt off. The tower, usually a symbol of strength and stability, seemed almost foreboding in the misty light. The graffiti that adorned its base, usually a vibrant splash of color and expression, seemed muted and somber. It was as though the tower was warning me, telling me that this climb would be different, that this time, the stakes were higher. I shook off the feeling, chalking it up to the early hour and the eerie weather. After all, I had come here for a purpose, and I wasn't about to be deterred by a bit of fog and a trick of the light. With a deep breath I shouldered my pack and began the ascent, each step taking me closer to the sky and further from the doubts that nipped at my heels. But as I climbed, the fog seemed to thicken, wrapping the tower and me in a shroud of uncertainty. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that there were eyes in the mist, following my every move. It was a sensation that crawled along my spine, a whisper of danger that I couldn't quite ignore. I pushed on, determined to reach the top, to complete the job and make the jump. But deep down, I knew that this climb was different. This time, I wasn't just challenging the tower or the sky. This time, I was challenging the very forces of nature, 
and the feeling in my gut told me that they weren't about to back down. The first steps of a climb are like the opening moves in a chess game, calculated, routine, but charged with the anticipation of the unknown. As I began my ascent up the cell tower, each rung was a familiar friend under my hands, cold and unyielding. The mist swirled around me, a ghostly dance partner that moved with a life of its own. Climbing a tower is a rhythm, a meditative process that's more about patience and persistence than strength. One hand over the other, the steady beat of boots on metal rungs, it's a ritual that I've come to know as well as the lines on my palms. Yet with every step upward, I felt a thrill, an electric tingle of danger and excitement that's as addictive as any drug. The fog was a shroud, wrapping the world below in a blanket of obscurity. It's not unusual for fog to settle in these valleys, but as I climbed higher, I expected it to thin, to reveal the grandeur of the Appalachians spread out below. Instead, it grew denser, enveloping me in a world that felt increasingly detached from the ground. There's something about being high above the earth, suspended between sky and soil, that puts things into perspective. Up here, the troubles and trials of everyday life seemed trivial, inconsequential. The higher I climbed, the more I felt like I was shedding the weight of the world, leaving it far below. But as I ascended, something nagged at the back of my mind, a whisper of unease that I couldn't quite shake. It was the feeling you get when you know you're not alone, that prickling sensation on the back of your neck. I told myself it was just the isolation playing tricks on me, the eerie silence amplified by the fog. Halfway up, I paused to rest, clipping my carabiner to a rung for a moment of respite. Hanging there, suspended in a world of mist, I let my eyes drift downward, a cardinal sin for climbers, but a temptation too strong to resist. That's when I saw it. Below me, obscured by the swirling fog, was a shape. It clung to the tower like some nightmarish creature from a forgotten folklore, a shadow within shadows. My first thought was that it was another climber, maybe some foolhardy soul seeking the same thrill I was. But something about the way it moved, the unnatural stillness of its form, set off alarms in my mind. Who's there? I called out, my voice swallowed by the mist. No answer came back, just the echo of my own words, distorted and strange. The shape didn't move, didn't respond. It just hung there, a part of the tower, and yet wholly alien. I shook my head, trying to dispel the creeping dread that was starting to take hold. It was probably just a trick of the light, a figment of my imagination spurred by the solitude and the strange atmosphere. With a deep breath, I unclipped and resumed my climb, pushing the sighting to the back of my mind. But as I ascended further into the fog, the sense of foreboding grew stronger, a tangible presence that seemed to cling to my skin. Something was up there with me, hidden in the mist, and the higher I climbed, the closer I felt to unveiling its mystery. The higher I climbed, the more the world below seemed to fade into a distant memory. The mist had turned from a mere curtain to a dense, enveloping blanket, isolating me in a sphere of eerie quiet. Up here, it felt like I was straddling two worlds, the familiar solid earth below, and something else, something unknown and unsettling above. The strange shape I'd seen earlier was no longer visible, but the impression it left was etched in my mind, a shadow that loomed larger with every step I took. I tried to focus on the climb, on the rhythmic motion of hand over hand, the steady clink of my carabiner, but the quiet was oppressive, filled with the weight of unspoken whispers. Then, it happened. I glanced down, a habit I couldn't shake, and there it was, the shape, closer now, unmistakably real and unnervingly wrong. Its proportions defied logic, its limbs elongated and twisted in ways that made my stomach churn. The fog seemed to cling to it, caress it, as if it were part of the mist itself. I stopped, my heart hammering in my chest, my breath coming in short, sharp gasps. Fear, raw and primal, surged through me, a tidal wave that threatened to sweep away my composure. This was no human, no fellow thrill-seeker. This was something else, something other. 
The creature, for I had no other word for it, moved with a grace that belied its grotesque form. It ascended the tower with an eerie, silent fluidity, its long, sinewy arms reaching and pulling with unnatural ease. Its skin, visible in patches through the fog, glistened like wet leather, reflecting the muted light in a way that made my eyes ache. I didn't want to look at its face, but some morbid curiosity compelled me. It was a horror, a twisted parody of human features stretched over a skull not meant for them. The eyes, though, were the worst. Pale, milky orbs that seemed to stare through me, seeing more than I ever wanted anyone or anything to see. Panic set in then, a cold, gripping panic that screamed at me to flee, to escape this nightmare that was all too real. But there was nowhere to go, nothing to do but climb, to put distance between myself and the abomination below. So I climbed, faster than I ever had, my mind a whirlwind of fear and confusion. Every rational part of me tried to make sense of what I was seeing, to find some logical explanation, but there was none, only the stark, terrifying reality of the moment. I dared another glance downward, and my blood ran cold. It was gaining on me, closing the distance with an inexorable, relentless determination. There was no sound, no animalistic growling or snarling, just the silent, methodical pursuit of a predator. In that moment I knew true terror, a fear so deep and visceral that it threatened to consume me. I was prey, hunted by something beyond my understanding, something that defied the laws of nature and man. All my life I'd sought thrills, sought to push the boundaries of fear and excitement. But this, this was different. This was a dance with death, and I was woefully unprepared for the steps. There's a point in every man's life when he faces something that strips away all the bravado, all the illusions of courage he's built up over the years. For me, that moment came at the top of that godforsaken cell tower, shrouded in a mist that seemed to be the very breath of the mountain itself. I had reached the summit, my lungs burning, my muscles screaming in protest. But physical pain was a distant concern compared to the terror that gnawed at my insides. The creature, that nightmare made flesh, was still below me, a relentless pursuer in this vertical chase. The tower's top platform was my temporary refuge, a metal oasis in a sea of fog. But it was just that, temporary. The trapdoor was locked, the padlock a cold mocking barrier to safety. I remember laughing, a short sharp bark of hysteria. Of all the times for protocol and security to be followed to the letter, I fumbled for the key, my fingers numb and clumsy with fear, but it wasn't there. Lost or forgotten, it didn't matter. I was trapped with nowhere to go but down, the base jump. The reason I'd come up here in the first place, now my only chance of escape. I'd made dozens of jumps before, each a thrilling dance with danger, but this was no thrill, this was survival. I harnessed myself into the parachute with shaking hands, my movements robotic, driven by the pure instinct to survive. I glanced over the edge of the platform, the fog a seemingly endless abyss below. Jumping into it was madness, a leap into the unknown in the most literal sense. But the alternative was unthinkable. I heard it then, the scrape of skin on metal, the soft, almost gentle sound of the creature pulling itself up the tower. I didn't dare look. I couldn't. My entire being was focused on the void in front of me, on the leap that I had to make. I threw myself off the tower, a silent prayer escaping my lips. The fall was a blur, time both stretching and compressing in a disorienting maelstrom of sensation. The cold air tore at my skin, the fog enveloping me, obscuring everything. Then the parachute deployed, a jarring, bone-snapping jerk that transformed my freefall into a controlled descent. I was a marionette, dangling from the strings of my chute, at the mercy of the winds and the whims of fate. The ground was invisible, the usual visual cues hidden by the dense fog. I was flying blind, every second a question mark, every heartbeat a drum roll to an unknown finale. Trees emerged from the mist like specters, their branches reaching for me like the fingers of ghosts. 
I twisted, turned, a desperate aerial dance to avoid their clutches. Then, the ground, a sudden jarring reality. I hit the fence, the razor wire a cruel, biting serpent. Pain exploded across my skin, but it was background noise, a triviality compared to the relief of solid earth beneath me. I lay there, tangled in my chute, gasping for breath, every inhale a sharp stab of pain. But I was alive. Alive, but not safe. Not yet. I scrambled to my feet, every movement agony, and stumbled towards my jeep. Behind me the tower loomed, a silent sentinel in the fog. I didn't look back, I couldn't. I just drove, drove until the mountains were a distant line on the horizon, and the nightmare was nothing but a memory. But some memories, they cling to you like shadows, following you long after the dawn has come. You'd think after an experience like that, life would feel different, like waking up from a nightmare into a world where the sun shines brighter and the air tastes sweeter. But it doesn't work that way. Not for me. Not after what I saw, what I felt on that tower. The drive back was a blur, my mind a chaotic whirlpool of fear and disbelief. The Appalachian landscape, once a source of peace and solitude, now felt oppressive, its secrets too dark, too deep. My hands were locked on the steering wheel, white-knuckled, as if letting go would mean surrendering to the horror that I'd left behind in those misty heights. I ended up at the ER, more out of instinct than conscious decision. The doctors and nurses gave me odd looks as they patched me up. Stitches for the cuts, bandages for the bruises. Their voices were distant, muffled under the ringing in my ears, the echo of a terror I couldn't shake. I told them I'd had an accident hiking, a fall. What else could I say? That a creature out of a horror story had chased me up a cell tower. They'd lock me up for sure. So I stayed silent, letting them believe what they would. Returning home was no relief. My house, once a haven, now felt like a prison, the walls too close, the windows too open. I kept seeing that thing in the shadows, in the corner of my eye, a persistent reminder of the fear that had sunk its claws deep into my soul. Sleep was elusive, a fleeting, restless state where nightmares waited. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, the creature's milky eyes boring into mine, its grotesque form a silhouette against my bedroom wall. The days blurred into one another, each the same as the last. I kept to myself, avoiding the calls and texts from friends and colleagues. I couldn't face them, couldn't pretend that everything was fine, that I was the same man I'd been before. And then, the message from my company, another job, another tower. The words on my phone screen seemed to mock me, a cruel reminder of a world I no longer belonged to. I couldn't go back. Couldn't face the height, the mist, the memory. So I ignored it, ignored them all. I'd find something else, something grounded, something safe. But safety is a lie, a thin veneer that masks the chaos lurking just beneath the surface. I sit now, looking out at the mountains that once called to me, their peaks hidden in the mist. They're different now, changed. Or maybe it's me who's changed who's seen the truth that hides in the fog and the shadows. The shotgun rests beside me, a cold comfort against fears I can't escape. Maybe I'll get a dog. Maybe two. Something to fill the silence, to chase away the shadows. But the mist is back, and with it, the memories, the fear. And I know, deep down, that no amount of locks on the doors or rounds in the chamber will keep it at bay. So I sit and wait, watching as the fog rolls in, wondering what other secrets it hides, what other nightmares lurk in the heart of these mountains. And I know, in a way I wish I didn't, that some mysteries are better left undiscovered, some fears better left unchallenged. For in the mist, there are things that defy understanding, that challenge the very nature of reality. And once you've seen them, once you've looked into the abyss, there's no going back. You're changed, marked by an experience that defies explanation, that haunts you long after the dawn has broken and the world has moved on. And all you can do is wait 
and watch and hope that the mist doesn't bring your nightmares back to life.